Hello and welcome to this webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Raymond Young. I'm the chair of the General Trustees and it's my pleasure to chair this uh, event this evening. We've got two other people around the table here. We have Ewan Leach from the Built Environment Forum Scotland and Ewan will explain his role in the whole consultation process. And we have David Robertson, who is probably well known to many of you as the Secretary of the General Trustees. Uh, we can see, you can see us, we can't see you, but we are looking forward to your questions uh, and we will be answering them uh, as they come through. Uh, and if we, by some reason, we get so many questions that we can't answer them all in the time we've got, we will be in touch to answer them, every one of them, over the next couple of days or so. So why are we here? Uh, we've been undertaking eight seminars over the last period of time. Uh, we'll have our last one on coming up on this Saturday in Stirling. But we thought it would be useful to try and find a way of getting to people who weren't able to come to our seminars uh, so that we could answer questions, we could encourage people to respond to the, the, the questionnaire that we've put out. We're particularly delighted uh, to see that people from far away places, as far as we're concerned, uh, people from the Isle of Harris, uh, people from the borders, people from uh, the, the west coast of Scotland, and various other places as well. So it was really good that you've been able to join us today. Let me just take uh, a couple of words about why we are actually doing this at all. Why are we doing this consultation? Well, those of you who might have been at the General Assembly will know that the radical action plan that was agreed by the Assembly effectively had three parts. There was the part coming from the Special Commission which talked about the restructuring, particularly of the centre and the refocusing of the church's activities on the local communities, on local congregations. There was the report, the second part was the report effectively from the Council Assembly, which now no longer exists because it's been taken over by the Assembly trustees. And it looked at more detailed ways, and in particular, uh, the issue of finance that might come to help plant new churches, grow churches, help congregations and presbyteries uh, through this new growth fund. And the third part of effectively the, the radical plan was about land and buildings. Uh, so we were at, at that process uh, of dealing with the land and buildings issue. In some ways, some people have said to us that land and buildings in the Church of Scotland is an elephant in the room. It's something which people say we should have been tackling before, but now we're tackling it. There are real issues about buildings. First of all, they are a huge resource. Uh, we have something like 3,000 buildings, excluding manses. Uh, they're all across Scotland. And if you look at, as compared to the Church of England, uh, which is about 10 times our size, it has 16,000 buildings. So you can work out that in some ways we've got s we, uh, somewhere proportionately around 1,600 to 2,000 buildings would be more sensible in our context. So we've actually got too many buildings. But those buildings are an important resource for local communities and for the local church. And they are also a very emotional resource. We all know the story that if somebody decides to move pews, uh, remove pews from the, from the church, then there can be an outcry with the old question about over my dead body, uh, will you remove the pews? So this is a delicate issue. It's an important issue but it is also an issue which means uh, that we've got to handle it in such a way that we take people with us. The third thing I'd want to say is that it's a challenging resource. The time and energy and money that's spent on looking after our buildings is huge. And the question is, how many are actually fit for purpose? 
uh, how do we manage them in the future? Which is why we've called our, our uh, consultation paper and the plan that we're developing well-equipped spaces in the right places. So, with that as the kind of background, why again are we here? Because the General Assembly approved this year the consultation paper. We took it to the General Assembly in 2018 to say we would want to produce a plan for church land and buildings which would, we would bring to the Assembly for approval in 2020. We decided that the approach was not simply to come with a set of recommendations, but actually to go through a process of saying, let's analyse the situation, let's put forward some ideas from the conversations we'd had with presbyteries and congregations over the years, Let's put those together in a paper which we put to the Assembly this year and said to the Assembly, we would like to consult with the, the, the church community and maybe even wider uh, on this consultation paper. In fact, what we put to the General Assembly was a recommendation that they encouraged the presbyteries and congregations. Presby the General Assembly said, no, we won't. We will not approve it on the basis of encourage. We will instruct presbyteries and congregation Kirk sessions to respond to this. And so we've been very keen to get as many people as possible uh, to, to answer the consultation. As you know, the church operates with a fairly short time scale. Uh, once you've had a general assembly, there's a few months where not terribly much happens. And then we've got to have things ready effectively by the end of uh, February for the Blue Book. So we've got a short period of, of a short window in which to do this consultation. And what's more, we don't really have the skills. Well, it's not our, our normal activity to run consultation events. So we decided that what we would do is we would hire an, org an outside organisation that has experience of doing consultation, has worked with the government, has worked with other partners, people we know uh, who have found them very successful. And it's been very important from our perspective to do that. It means that the, the consultation is being done by an independent organisation. We are here, but BEFs, will actually do the consultation and produce a report which will be published and public. We will not have a redacted report. We will not have just the bits that we want. We will have the whole report. So it's very important that we should do that. And so what I want to do is hand over to, first of all, to Ewan Leach, who is uh, the director of BEFS, and he will explain a little bit more about what we've been doing. Ewan, it's what are you up to? Thank you, Raymond. Um, so I'm Ewan Leach. I'm the director of the Built Environment Forum Scotland. I should probably tell you a little bit about BEFS before uh, I tell you what we've done at the workshops. We're a strategic intermediary body, which is another name for an umbrella body, uh, for organisations who are interested in the built environment. And our membership is organisations such as professional bodies covering architecture, uh, surveying, planning, archaeology, and also Civic Sector Scotland, the National Trust for Scotland, and uh, the Scottish Civic Trust, the Architectural Heritage Society, and our interests encompass everything from archaeology to landscapes to buildings. And our main area of work is around public policy and legislation, and trying to influence policy and legislation both at government level and in public bodies that favours the historic built environment primarily. And as a result of that, a lot of the work that we do is responding to consultations that come from government or public bodies. And so in light of that, we have quite a long experience of working with the consultation process. And because of the nature of our organisation with very wide interests, we also have quite a lot of interest of working with stakeholders who have quite broad and sometimes uh, differing points of view. So it's in that role that um, the General Trustees have invited us to run this consultation. So we have an interest um, and I suppose passion for the historic environment, so we like 
the church estate and we want the best for that in the future. Um, our members in general do. Um, but we are equipped to run consultations. And I suppose on the back of that, on the first thing I would say about that is some of you may have already had a look at what the consultation has to say. Some of you may have downloaded it and have had a look at it on screen. There are paper copies which Sarah Deeks has um, and if you want to email her, um, her email is at the bottom of the web page you're currently on, um, she can send some out and we've been handing them out at the workshops. In responding to consultations, very often consultations are quite frustrating. This is quite a long consultation, it might be longer than the one that I would have written myself, um, but it is what it is and it has a lot of information and requires a lot of thought. But consultations are of, often frustrating because uh, they don't ask exactly what you want them to ask or there's too much information or you feel you're being directed in a certain way. If you feel that way, that's normal. Um, our work is kind of responding to consultation and invariably you feel a bit frustrated. In the consultation that's come from the General Trustees, while you're being given options within it, there are always free text boxes after every question, which allows you to say why you don't agree with the way the question is framed. But it, I want to assure you that it is normal to find the consultation process is vaguely frustrating. As I've said, it's quite a long, a long consultation document. If the text wasn't there, you would feel frustrated in the absence of the text. The text is necessary in framing the questions. I think when you go onto the survey monkey, um, it may tell you it will take you 25 minutes to do it. It may take you longer than that to do. You may want a cup of tea or one glass of wine, maybe two, but no more than that while you're doing the consultation process. But it does require some thought and maybe reading through the entire document before answering the questions um, would be recommended so that you've had some time to gather your thoughts. I think that's I suppose, as much as I would say about the process itself. One of the questions that has come up in the workshops we've done was can this process be manipulated? And the answer to that is yes. If a lot of you got together and decided you wanted to do something underhand, you could skew this consultation process. I don't imagine that the members of the Church of Scotland will want to do that, but if there was an attempt to do that, we've gathered as much information as possible to identify any varying patterns in the responses that we ask for. We're not asking for your own personal details. It asks for the church that you're in, the presbytery that you're from, the Kirk Session, and the first uh, three or four letters of your postcode. But we cannot identify who is responding to this. So there is a degree of anonymity about it. And obviously the whole thing is being based on, on trust. So the general trustees trust you to answer honestly and as do we in forming this report. We will gather all the data that is, comes in through the online survey. It runs until the 31st of October, and then we will produce a report over the next month to give to the general trustees uh, at the beginning of December. So we will know what we give in that report. If there was any changes made to it, we would be aware of that. So you could come back to us and ask, is this the full report? We anticipate it will be the full report that gets made uh, to the trustees. So that's some of the background to the consultation process itself. We've been having some workshops over the past month and um, we've had eight. Well, we will have had eight by the time uh, Sterling takes place. And the reason for those workshops is um, to gather additional information. So what we're doing this evening, this webinar, we're not able to gather information from you because of the nature of the setup. Um, there is an opportunity, obviously, for you to ask questions. But what we've been doing at the workshop is really stimulating some thought amongst the attendees. Uh, and before they do the, the response and for them to also meet their peers who may have a different experience in managing uh, church property and buildings and so that people are able to think about other people's experience as well before submitting their own response because the consultation is asking you strategic questions while there is a, a probably a, an inclination for us all to think about what's our personal experience in dealing with our own um, church or uh, church hall or manse um, it's possibly quite good to think about what are other people's experience uh, in this so that a strategic approach can be developed that can benefit everybody in varying and different circumstances across the whole of Scotland depending on whether or not they're a rural or an urban church and that, that both will benefit from any plan that develops from that. So one reason that we've brought people together is to encourage that um, engagement across different congregations and across different presbyteries. Um, I suppose another reason is for us to gather further anecdotal information because workshops are run with uh, flip charts and post-it notes and sticky dots, uh, a consultation process that doesn't, doesn't suit everybody, but it's a really good way of gathering um, information. So we've got lots of post-it notes from the seven that we've had, 
my office is awash with post-it notes <laughs> um, from the workshops that we've had, uh, asking questions about how uh, the attendees feel about certain things. And what we've just done is analyse the longer document and look for what are the overarching themes that are being asked within this document. There was obviously an analysis of the current church situation. Um, but there's also what is your own experience in managing the buildings that you're responsible for. But what we've been done doing at the workshop is it has three kind of short sessions within it. And the first session is really to provoke some thought. And we've been asking the members who are attending that to think about places that they, things that they do and the places that they do them and why they choose those places to do those activities. And fundamentally, it's come down to two, maybe three things. One is the convenience of its accessibility, both its accessibility in terms of how you get there, and once you're there, is it easy to get into? The second thing that people um, are interested in is often a warm welcome uh, at the place. Um, and one of the fundamental things that has come up at every single workshop, and people have laughed and giggled about this, but toilet facilities is a really fundamental thing to it as well, as to why people choose to go to the places that they do. So having somewhere that's accessible, has a toilet, and also if it's dependent on other equipment once you're there, often things like Wi-Fi, projectors, things like that, they're necessary. And we've asked people to talk about a range of uh, uh, activities, from knitting classes to Zumba classes to rock climbing, um, all sorts of different things, but also things like shopping and cafes, why you choose to go to them. Just to stimulate some thought about why you as an individual would choose a certain location to go, go to. So, but those are the outcomes that we've gathered from that. We then move on to then look at specifically what your experience in your church is around four distinct uh, types of responsibility you may have uh, in your congregation. And what we've uh, created is a chart that asks how much time and effort you spend on different responsibilities. And it's, there are four areas that we've identified you're being asked about within uh, the consultation document. One is the management of manses, one is the church fabric, and one is the use of the building. And the final area that we've identified as church land, which is anything else, which is basically not any of those three things. So it could be graveyards, it could be car parks, it could be glebes. But it's primarily the interest lies around manses, church fab management of church fabric, maintenance, projects, and um, church uses. And when we say church uses, we're talking about arranging a, a variety of activities that may, may take place with multiple users using your space. And so the time that's spent doing that. And consistently across the seven workshops, what it's revealed is that land from 90, over 90% is not proving time consuming or high effort. Church fabric is the one that is consistently coming out as the one that is requiring the most time and effort to be spent on, followed by managing the uses that take place within that. Manses are divisive. Manses fall into either they're not a problem or they are a problem. And when they're a problem, they're a real problem. Um, so it kind of varies within the groups that we're meeting as to what they're own congregations experiences in terms of the responsibilities are. When it comes to fabric management in particular, while most, again I would say 90% are saying that takes the most time and effort organising the maintenance, repair or a project around the church building, at every workshop we've had there has been one, at least one congregation that has said it isn't a huge amount of time and effort because they are in a position where they have a church that is in good condition and they have a committee that is looking after it well and the maintenance runs fairly smoothly. They are in the minority, but they, at each workshop, somebody says it works for us and it has been working consistently. They are obviously good case studies for the rest um, of the Church of Scotland, possibly to be looked at later. Um, but that is a fairly consistent message that it comes out Church use, it varies. Everyone says it takes quite a lot of time and effort, but it depends on how much use a building is being put to, whether or not it needs an intensive amount of management uh, or someone's time and whether or not there's paid staff as well. What we've then gone to do is look at what are the solutions that would make those things easier for um, the fabric committees, fundamentally, um, in, in addressing that job. And I think while there are a variety of answers and there are a variety of um, solutions suggested within the consultation document, which I won't list for you now, you will be able to read them online. Um, but the 
solutions that are being suggested in the workshops are, are mainly drawn from um, the consultation document, but they are the two things that are coming up the most. One is that there is a need for support in procuring tradespeople at a local level and that they would seek support in this and that they see the people who have attended the previous workshops would see an advantage in groups of local churches working together around procuring skilled tradespeople. What there's then a desire for is at presbytery level there to be a building professional that offers support as well. And I think one of the suggestions is having um, the procurement of the five yearly surveys being done at general trustee or a presbytery level, there's quite a lot of favour uh, around that. And the, the gathering of the data on the surveys of the buildings would then be a more consistent gathering uh, of the data. But I would still say there's a high recognition that in commissioning tradespeople to maintain the building, that needs to happen at a more local level. And on, on reflection, some of the responses we're getting online also kind of reflect that kind of uh, discussion. So those are the two main solutions that are being sought uh, in, the, in the workshop setting. The consultation obviously asks quite a lot more, but those are the two areas that we've sort of identified as an area that there seems to be quite a lot of support for. The final part of the workshop um, is really thinking longer term about what people want for their own church. And going back to the first question that we asked as to why do you choose to go to the places you do, we kind of conclude by saying, what are the benefits of sharing spaces? Because obviously sharing is something that comes out strongly within the consultation document. There's quite a level of recognition that sharing is easier where you have higher levels of population. And so for rural congregations, sharing is maybe there's less opportunity. But the benefits that arise from sharing that are being identified as the ones that they would like to see for, for their own congregations are shared costs, so a really pragmatic reason, and for the benefits to the community. And that, as the workshops have progressed, has fallen into two categories. Benefits to the church community and having more people come in and use your building and being able to feel relaxed about using a church space, which they may not have gone into before. But also, the, particularly in the last two workshops, it's come out that the benefits of the church being a community hub, that the benefits are there actually for the wider community, where it's for people who are uh, attending church or not, that these are good things that individuals would like to see happening within their own community. And so it's giving that warm welcome and that there's a real human element to it is clearly the thing that people think is one of the most important things to be welcoming to a broader community and a broader range of uses within the church. At the workshops, some of the challenges around sharing also come up, um, which cannot be denied that sharing also has uh, complexities. Um, but people clearly do see that there are benefits in potentially sharing while acknowledging that there are challenges as well. So that kind of gives a summary of um, the workshops that we've had up to now, which have been in Aberdeen, Inverness, Perth, Edinburgh, Kilmarnock, Lockerbie, have we missed one? Glasgow. Glasgow. How could I miss Glasgow? <laughs> uh, and Glasgow, and the final one is in Stirling this weekend. Okay, thank you. I can see we've got some questions waiting. Uh, and maybe we shall move on to that uh, now we start to the, the plan hopefully is that people will uh, will, will start to, to, to feed in questions which we will answer the first one I see is says will the report be made available to everyone Ewan do you want to say yes <laughs> <laughs> yes well the, the report will be made available to everyone I think by the general trustees yes. We haven't agreed whether or not Beth will make it available on our website, but we can if the general trustees are, are happy with that. I think we, we will want to make this as open as yeah. possible. David, do you want to...? Yes, I think the, uh, there's nothing to hide in the report. Uh, we are inviting folks to contribute to this exercise. Um, it's a, it really will help to set the future direction for the use of our land and buildings assets. It will help identify where those assets are actually liabilities are causing problems for congregations uh, and are no longer perhaps fit for purpose. So it's a critical that the report is as widely read as it can be. So yes, it will be an unredacted uh, warts and all uh, publication. Now we've got a question that says how best to feedback during this webinar, virtual post-its. <laughs> <laughs> There's an interesting one. Well, we understand that the that your text will be um, captured 
and there's a recording be, there's a recording be made of this. Uh, so if you post anything uh, online, then yes, that will be captured and that's information that we can take back. But I would stress that the best way of giving us information is by responding to the online survey. Um, Post-it notes give us some, um, give us a flavour of what we need to expect and in terms of how the consultation is being received. But what we've also said at the workshops is that one of the intentions of the workshops is to turn the people who attend the workshops into missionaries for the consultation and that they will encourage as many people as possible to respond to it. The consultation is targeted at people involved in fabric management but it is open for everyone to respond to. So anybody internal to the church or external, it's primarily people internal to the church that are responding, so anyone can respond to that. So yes, put something in text just now uh, as, a, as a virtual post-it note on the webinar, but it's, m it's more important that you uh, pass information to us through the online survey. Thanks. We've got one. How much of the output is likely to be enforced and how much encouraged at the end of this? I think there's, that's one for us. That's one for us. Um, bear in mind that the trustees' analysis of the report of the consultation will be brought to the General Assembly yeah. in May 2020. So, in a sense, it's very much up to the General Assembly to decide how much of the uh, proposed plan, land and buildings plan, is actually agreed and adopted. Uh, there may be parts which aren't, um, and it might be quite an interesting uh, discussion at the General Assembly um, before we get to the end yeah. of that. Um, I hope that actually people are in effectively encouraged. This, uh, beating people about the head with a stick and telling them to do Absolutely. something doesn't really work. Uh, this ha people have to buy into this. Yeah. Uh, but I hope that the quality of the initial consultation process, the quality of the analysis which will be undertaken by BEFs uh, and the presentation to the Assembly will in fact be sufficient to give people the assurance that this is as open and as transparent and as honest as we can yeah. possibly make it. Can I just add to that? I think it might be, you know, there's quite a lot in here where we're suggesting there are different ways of doing things. For example, in Mansis, we're suggesting that there are a number of ways in which manses could be looked after. I think we're stressed, uh, and we certainly should stress, that a, quite a, a lot of what we're suggesting is to be on a voluntary basis. That if there, what we have at the present moment in the Church of Scotland is one model that fits everything, or that's the plan. We know that the model doesn't fit everything. So what we're saying is we need a range, a variety, a menu of choices for local congregations to actually make those decisions. They say, yes, we would be better to manage our property because the general trustees simply own the property on behalf of the congregation. And it's up to the congregation through the Kirk session to decide how it best wants to manage that. And so we're offering in this a wider variety of options uh, than we've got at the present moment. And if you can think of additional ones we would very much like them as well. This is the thinking that we've had, along with one with people we've listened to for a while. Un new ideas are still expected. Now, I think we've just missed one. I just missed the previous one. Can you go back? Will the feedback from the workshops be included in the final report? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. we, we will, so we are ga all the information that we gather from the um, workshops, we are collating they're on post-it notes, they're being put into a spreadsheet. My colleague Ilsa, who's currently on holiday in South Korea, is coming home to some more work. Um, <laughs> and so we have a very extensive spreadsheet of all the yeah. comments on that. Not all of that will go into it, but we will be lifting bits from the uh, workshops so that the tone and the general responses of the workshops will be uh, reflected in the uh, final analysis as well. I suppose it should make it clear that what BEFs are doing is doing an analysis of what you tell the general trustees through this. We won't be in a position to be saying you should or shouldn't do this, but we will say your suggestions that are gaining support or not gaining support and what the public is, or what the members of the church uh, are saying in response to that. So all we will be doing is reflecting in a more synthesized way what the general kind of consensus is and where there are outliers as well because 
what's clear within the workshops is while there can be high amounts of agreement around certain things, we will always make it clear that while the majority or 90% agree around something, that there are individuals or specific places that uh, have a different experience or desire some different form of support. Can you also answer the next one? What assistance will be given to help readers interpret or understand the report of the consultation? Is a danger in readers not easily understanding the details of such a report? How do you write a, a, a report, and will you write a report, that is reader-friendly and not just some kind of technical report? Yeah, we will make sure that the report is readable. We're working with um, somebody who works in data analysis, a guy called Stephen Donnelly, um, who's a really nice writer because I think it's important that these sort of reports are written in a, a way that as many people as possible can understand. Um, and at the end of it, there'll be a more technical um, report which gives the stats. Um, but it will be written in a way that is, is readable and so that it's comprehensible to people like me. I don't particularly like just sitting around reading stats. I am interested in something that I will, doesn't read like a novel, it's not fiction. Um, but something that is readable. So it will be presented in a way that uh, gives a flavour of what the uh, workshops have said, what is being said in the free text within the responses, as well as where there are, are clear directions that are suggested within uh, the response to the consultation. Do you want me to take this next one? About the, use the term rural several times this evening. What do we mean by rural in this day and age? Uh, and the comment is that I have serious concern that rural congregations will be most likely to suffer with the proposed changes. Uh, I'm from a semi-rural uh, congregation myself uh, in the middle of Perthshire and uh, have spent years dealing with rural housing. So I'm, I'm very sensitive and very keen to ensure that we do actually ensure that we understand there is a different message, a different role in many cases for rural churches as compared to city churches. And by rural, I actually, we do actually, we don't use any of the, the definitions and I suppose the church really should actually have a definition of what it means by rural uh, because clearly there are rural, there's, there, there's what one might describe as suburban rural there's uh, you know, where people are actually living in the country but are actually working in towns and not having any r rural relationships uh, through to remote, very remote communities. And I would think that those kind of communities, those rural areas, uh, we, we are really keen to see what you think should happen in the rural areas. I, I'm, I'm a very strong b personal belief uh, that uh, rural, rural churches play a, a very important role in the life of their local community and we need to reflect that uh, and, and somehow we've got to get that against. I, I suspect a number of this, the issues are not something, not necessarily to do with rural but it's actually going to be to do with the problem, some of the problems are to do with places where, well, it's the sins of the fathers. You know, in the 19th century, 20th century, sins of the fathers of schisms, where we have buildings that are close to one another. Uh, and how do we handle these, uh, particularly in some of the towns? Uh, so I'm prepared to put that on the table and say, I think that's some of the, the bigger issues. We can see it in the cities, we can see it in towns as well. Dear David, do you want to add to yeah, that? The, the one comment I would make is that in the consultation response, uh, the, one of the first yeah. uh, set of questions, um, uh, section four, it asks you, do you consider um, your congregation to be urban, rural or semi-rural? And um, for those of you um, who, for example, you look at the uh, CIS database, uh, which contains details of, of uh, congregations, that's a, an, if you like an official Scenario. designation. That's the central information system. Um, it, I suspect, would also be notified in any communications from Presbytery if your congregation is rural, yeah. urban or semi-rural. So there is a, for the purposes of the consultation response, uh, each congregation will fall into one of those three categories. But in a, in a wider sense, in our discussions and our talk this evening, um, we're, you know, we're not being so prescriptive right. when we talk about rural. 
Okay. Prevent individual responses or group responses? I, I think there was actually was one it, before that. that, that we, I, think that, I think that was. Was it? I don't think it was. was I think it? it's that one. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, both. Well, the, both. Document, the document allows for both. Um, and I suppose this is one area where if there was to be manipulation, so if there was a joint Kirk session response and you didn't agree with your Kirk session's response, you could respond as an individual, uh, which would be able to be analysed to reveal if there are any differences between session responses and individual responses. So of the responses we're getting, we are getting both. Uh, I think I currently have 85 uh, responses on behalf of Kirk sessions. Uh, probably have a lot more from in individuals within Kirk Sessions. Uh, so if you feel that you're able to do it as a group within the Kirk Session and you have consensus, uh, then entirely do it that way. But if people still want to do it individually, there's, there's nothing to stop them, anybody from doing it. Audio report, or is it only written? It, it will be a written report. If you have a PDF reader, then that would be one means of um, making it audio. Right. We would have to think about that one. Yeah, but that's yeah. a useful comment. It's yeah. a very useful comment. It needs to be as yep. accessible as yep. possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, some more detail of the type of property support you're thinking that might be available at Presbytery on a Presbytery day-to-day -day basis for local churches. David, do you want to...? Yes, we'll have a go at that. <laughs> the, the, um, let's look, look at the question. Yes. The, the, there are uh, the, the the third section in the report is uh, is a key area three b unburdening congregations, and that's beginning to look at exactly this the, what are the practical um, support that can be given. It's maybe worth just saying at the outset that um, we're not worrying at this stage about how all this might be financed and funded. Yep. That is another piece of work that needs to be done assuming that the General Assembly yep. um, supports and approves the, 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 the report. But one issue that's been developing over the last 18 months is uh, we've been working with uh, two separate clusters of presbyteries. Presbytery clerks who've come together um, without being forced to do so but have, have engaged together and have asked the trustees to come and discuss what sort of practical support might be beneficial in their particular presbytery areas. And the idea that's being developed is the, what is the scope for that cluster to appoint a paid professional buildings officer who will work across the congregations in the cluster, who will, for example, undertake the professional inspection reports on a five yearly basis, will work with the Kirk Sessions or the Congregational Boards in looking at the detail of that report so that it doesn't just go back up on somebody's shelf, it's actually a working document. And the officer would make sure that the urgent repairs that have been identified in the report are actually done. So the leaking downpipe that's just cracked doesn't then become the leaking downpipe that's been pouring water over the wall over the last five years. So we're Working on this, we're trying to see if how the funding of that can be achieved at possibly neutral cost to congregations. But the point is, congregations and presidents are asking for something practical that will give real value for the money that they are currently paying for professional reports, which essentially are done by external uh, organisations, agencies and firms. Um, so we're looking at this, and this is in response to something that's been identified by two sets of presbyteries, two clusters of presbyteries, um, and uh, we're hoping that this might be taken forward in the f fairly so. near future. Uh, perhaps watch the space at the General Assembly and we'll be able to tell you something about yeah. that. So that's an example of the, the practical support. There's other suggestions uh, in the consultation. Um, whether they are all achievable remains to be seen, um, and that, that's a, a a lot of work to be done on this. We're asking at the moment for suggestions of what might be practical and we'll certainly undertake to look into those. Yeah, I think just to add to that, if I could, before we go on to this next question, and I think there, the, the, the stuff which Ewan was talking about earlier, where people were saying at the consultation that the idea of how do we find contractors 
locally? How do we get, you know, where do we get support in that sense? Can we, is it possible that clusters of groups of churches can get together or the presbytery could, could actually uh, help with, you know, people who will do, say for example, an annual inspection of roofs and follow it up with, with, with work to the roofs. What about gutter cleaning? Can we do that, not by each congregation doing it, but could the presbytery organise, you know, the, in September there's a regular inspection of gutters and downpipes. Those kinds of things, I think, are the kind of thing. And certainly we would welcome comments of, of what else people could do that actually benefits from the fact that, well, there's a whole group of us here working together and each instead of each picking it off one by one, are we able to start to work together at probably at presbytery level uh, to actually do that? Mm -hmm. Let's and let's get say those are what we'd like to get to and then having if that's what people say we should be doing, then we can spend the next period of time saying, Yes, how do we get that and what the resources? Mm -hmm. the, the, there is already uh, one congregation that we know of who uh, is partnering with a housing association, a local yep. housing association, yep. uh, whose uh, maintenance team uh, under a contract, so it's getting paid for it, this is not being done on the cheap, uh, this, the housing association staff will be uh, cleaning the gutters, making sure the paint work's done, the basic maintenance, yep. but that's often the stuff that congregation members find difficult to, uh, in practice, to achieve and implement. Right, if I, pick, I think we can answer the next one quite quickly. If a presbytery is currently reviewing its own resources and looking at developing a strategy, would you recommend that they enlist the help, support and advice of the general trustees before a final such strategy is proposed? The answer is yes. And it would actually be better not, fairly early on in the process. We've been working with a couple of presbyteries and we've got some ways of doing this, I think, that we mentioned in, in the, the consultation process a uh, document, what we've been doing with St Andrews particularly, as a bit, and, and also now with, with Aberdeen, in helping them to look at that. Okay, now here's an interesting one. New ideas generate income for churches by a national network of c electric car charging points. Just need a car parking bay main set. Thank you, that's a, and ideally not overly used in the week. Parish churches would be ideally, especially revenue generator. That's, a good, that's the kind of suggestion that we look forward to getting in the report because it's an idea which I, I, we hadn't thought of. That's a very clever, good idea. Let's, and we would be look at that and be able to see how we actually could implement that. Thank you. Does well-equipped spaces in the right places possibly the solution in some instances? There are new building in a particular location. It's really... Yeah. Or is this really all about simplifying, optimising the management use of existing buildings? No, it's not about just about. We are very much look to the question of are, do we? It might be better for a brand new building in a particular location. And I, I think the, it's interesting that the priorities which the General Assembly gave to the Assembly trustees in terms of the new grant regimes was about planting new churches. So it's not about just about looking after existing buildings. This is about where do we need to go in the future, long-term strategy, when you actually start to look at places. Well, Shetland has been a good example. You know, well, there are things we need to do which we haven't done before. Uh, and I think, yes, uh, so it is about a whole range of opportunities that we hadn't thought of before. Right. Well, Do you want me to read this one out? Yes. What strategies will be employed to tackle poorly equipped spaces in the wrong places when its congregation has no vision or inclination for change? <laughs> oh, there's a lot in there. Uh. Um, I think the, um, the wh 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 where's the reference to the office bearers? There's uh, reference to the yeah. congregation. What are the office bearers doing about this? Um, and actually the main thing, sorry, it's a fly buzzing yeah. around here. Um, the other issue I think is, is where is the presbytery in this? Yeah. Um, the, the, we are a Presbyterian organization. Uh, presbyteries themselves, like congregations, are struggling in many ways with implementing all the jobs and tasks that they're given uh, to do. Um, and I think this, this is exactly the sort of issue that 
Um, th this is not what the General Trustees are necessarily there to do. We can, we can advise and support, and the, the consultation suggests some uh, uh, factors, some elements, which should be part of the common thinking about this. It's not prescriptive, though, but that might help a congregation and its office bearers to begin to see for themselves where the problems are with the building and whether it's poorly equipped or if it's in the wrong place or perhaps both. So the, um, yeah, uh, this is, a, this is the, the common situation where it needs a team effort. It needs presbyteries and it needs the trustees and it needs um, buy-in from congregational office bearers to try and solve this very problem. There's a whole section right in the middle here of the, the use of local church review because clearly that's where presbyteries should be working through with congregations uh, and so the, the responses to that. Can I, I, that question, well, maybe best for you to answer, but from a Beth's perspective, so this is me speaking now, no longer as the um, organisation running the consultation, but one of the things that we're interested in is what is the outcome of the consultation, what are the implications in the Church of Scotland's Radical Action Plan? We are having, we will be having one extra workshop with Beth's member organisations and some other stakeholders, so um, non Church of Scotland stakeholders, to make them aware of the discussion that's happening internally um, and for them to consider what role they can play while you're having to maybe make some challenging decisions and when some decisions are made around the churches that maybe turn out to be in the wrong place, um, what happens to them then? Because there's obviously um, an interest in Civic Scotland as to what happens to a number of those buildings and I'm interested in making sure that some of our members who are uh, community focused um, see the role that they have to play in some of those maybe challenging discussions that may have to be had in the future. Okay, only 85 responses from Kirk Sessions so far. Can't be made of responses on what is good or not good level of response from <laughs> Yes, name the, shall we name the, uh, those who respond and those who don't respond? Uh, is it, you know, particularly since this is an instruction from the General, uh, General Assembly, we certainly will be able to tell you how many at the end of the day. We suspect where well, this is, what, the 7th of the 8th of January? October. So October. We've got, we've got three weeks. You've got three weeks, and I'm hoping that, that we're hoping that this will increase. Okay. Anything? Anyone you want to add to that? Do no, so? uh, we haven't agreed whether or not we will publish the list of all no, Kirk sessions. Uh, from my perspective, we have had a lot of responses at this uh, point in time. You would kind of expect there to be a rapid increase as you get close to the deadline date. I don't reply to consultation documents until uh, very close to the wire. The night before. But I would, like it, but I would be really <laughs> happy if everyone uh, replied long yep. before then. Oh, well, um, but yeah. you expect it to increase uh, close to the time. Yeah. Right. Well, you guys look this one up, I'll read it. <laughs> what doubtful the data referred to in consultation question six, sufficiently comprehensive to use by pres in presbytery and planning. How can this assumption be tested? Uh, remind me what question six is. Where does the church go from here? Question six is, yep. uh, on the ongoing discussion, the general trustees are proposing the following principles to underpin all the proposals. The principles being building yep. and glebe land are simply by means of which. Yeah. But there, I don't think this is the principles. So see who scribbled most of this. These are the principles under which we are suggesting that we test the rest. So this is not enough for presbytery planning. What we're actually ask, suggesting that presbytery planning needs to deal with the whole question about what kind of, of spaces do we need? Where should they be? Uh, when we did the work with St. Andrew's Presbytery, the presbytery there started with a consultation with for the entire presbytery saying what is it we think makes a well-equipped space in the right place and it was on that basis which the presbytery wide everybody agreed to it and that was then used and i think those conversations need to develop from this to look at it in a more local situation uh, and I think that's we, we, you know, what we need to do there. And this kind of ties up to the next question about taking into consideration the more rural towns. 
with four or five denominations with a handful of believers in each. Could we join with others and choose the best building? Why not? Is I think is the question I would want to put back. Uh, question question twenty two asks ask exactly about ecumenical sharing. That. Yep, please. Okay, and asking about grouping together. How about a w w which trusted trader type database? Okay, uh, one church can hear of other good experience. Yes, and that 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 probably would be at a presbytery level. Good point to put in as one of the as one of the ideas that we should be developing. Uh, here of others good experiences. Okay, all of a sudden it's gone wham. Uh, everybody's now coming in. Right. Uh, lots of things that are standard for every coordination. Reduce every co yes. These are exactly the kind of thing. Pat testing, extinguisher testing, asbestos survey. Kind of all of these themselves. And that's exactly the kind of thing which should go into the consultation and say, yes, these are the things we can do. Next one. Restrictions, you? Ah, David, you're the lawyer here. <laughs> uh, so you have to answer this one. Yes. Uh, uh, are the restrictions on use of buildings with regard to Oscar? Uh, I would answer no to that because Oscar is a regulator of charity activity. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the resources, it doesn't have the staff to do much more than uh, administer the, 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 the regulation of the charitable sector in Scotland. Um, so it would be interesting to have a bit more background on, on on an actual example of what that might, might mean. I don't know if this is helpful, but from the purposes of the uh, in, insurance side of things, uh, there is a remarkably wide range of weird and wonderful activities which are now regarded by the insurance company as straightforward congregational activities uh, which are fully covered by insurance, um, bouncy castles and just about anything else you can think of. Uh, so. Uh, I, I don't think there's too much of a problem uh, with, with on the, from the charity regulator about how we use our buildings. Um, there may be some issues to do with uh, if you're running a cafe which is so commercially successful that it's generating a huge profit, uh, there may be issues to do with, with uh, rates, um, but that's pretty rare uh, in, in the scale in which congregations are operating. Yeah, and uh, of course that also might be if the presbytery thinks that you're doing a, activities, you, you're using the building for activities that are, are not compatible with Christianity, then that, yeah. at that point in time it would be the presbytery a superintendent's issue rather than a, an Oscar issue. Yeah. Right, team effort to solve the problem of wrong buildings, who makes it? presbytery at the end of the day uh, and that's quite critical um, the presbytery is the organ the body that has the, the has the responsibility uh, under the, and, and, the power. And, and the power to do this what we can do to do is to help the presbytery on that mm -hmm. going back to that question have you got any examples of where that's happened recently where a decision has been made collectively within a thinking of some of the towns where there's multiple churches how they've reached that decision, the process around it. Oh, um, sorry, uh, I'm throwing a question in. <laughs> yeah, uh, St Andrews, I mean, we're, yes, we're looking at a number mm -hmm. of places in St Andrews Presbytery where the St Andrews is now working through that, uh, that whole business uh, of which is the right, <laughs> which is the right way of doing it. Can you read them out? So I'm in t being reminded we need to read them out. Sorry, I thought... Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the next one is quinquennial is mentioned a few times. Have these not been binned? No. Well, the name has been binned. binned and sorry if we have mentioned quinquennial in the report, um, uh, in, in the consultation paper. Uh, we're now calling them five-yearly property surveys or five-yearly property inspections. Uh, so, yes, uh, quinquennial does uh, have a... I meaning, as it says on there, our LCR, local church review, has yeah. been delayed by a year, and I've still not been told if there's a property element to this. Now, um, local church review does use the word quinquennial, so 
when we use the word quinquennial, we're meaning five yearly property inspections. Um, the trustees' view would be that um, local church review probably should have a property element to it. Um, it's just, it doesn't make sense to, to uh, keep separate um, the effectiveness of the congregation's mission and outreach and worship activity from how it uses its buildings. Yeah, and I think uh, that it's really important that people stress in the response to this that, that relationship between the, the resources, buildings, finance, and people resources in relation to the local church review, uh, because that's where the, the decisions can be developed and worked through. The next one comes from one of these congregations that we really love, that they've looked at their buildings, and I know some presbyteries have done this, they've reduced their, this one says we are a congregation that, that has over a period of many years reduced its buildings from six to two the survey seems to assume that congregations have not made these decisions which is rather frustrating for a hard-working property committee well well done to that property committee and well done to that presbytery in the congregation we apologize if that's the way you feel about it but actually uh you are in a minority and that's why we have we have been encouraging it. And this one. Will new presbyteries under the Radical Action Plan employ people to supervise maintenance of property? David, do you want to? Yes. This is um, the buildings officer in again. a way, I think this, this picks up what I was talking earlier about the potential for paid buildings yep. officers uh, who are professionally qualified. Um, and supervised maintenance of property is actually um, it's quite a, the, the, the wording could be l maybe a, a bit ambiguous. Um, I suppose at the end of the day, a congregation still has a responsibility to, in a sense, supervise the maintenance of its property. It really is the question of what sort of support does it need in order to achieve that. Some congregations will need very little support, others will need considerably more. Um, and it could well be that a, the buildings officer uh, function would develop to include uh, where appropriate and where really needed, some form of almost hands-on help. Right, the next question is, can you tell us about some of the innovations the recently formed Presbytery Strategy and Innovation Committee have been working on? Well, well done to somebody who's managed to work out that <laughs> the General Trustees have set up this new committee, and it's so new we're still working through innovations. Basically, the, it's spending time just now dealing with Presbytery Strategy, uh, it's been working with a number of presbyteries on looking at the longer term strategy. Some of the innovation that's being looked at is about uh, there's one particular uh, project that's looking at how do we take some of the, the more the larger buildings, the very, some of the main buildings of, of, that are belong to the nation as a whole effectively, uh, you know, big churches, city centre, big traditional churches that whose history goes back hundreds of years. Other ways in which a congregation that's small within that uh, can develop, how does it look after its building? And there are conversations going on with Historic Environment Scotland about that, conversations going on with others as well. So that's the kind of in innovation. There's another innovation that's going on with another congregation and a priority area in which we're looking at is there a way in which a community development group can take full responsibility for this building but allow the congregation to remain and to be part of it but not have the burden of the day-to-day -day maintenance. So some new ideas about that. We've just missed, we're rolling back, we've missed I think a couple of questions. Right, this one says, the difficult question is the one relating to small rural churches and how they identify a way forward when each individual church is well maintained but with a small weekly worshipping number. The practicalities of managing buildings this is an easy one. This is where I would love to, that we were able to have a conversation on this because I'd like to understand if the building is well maintained uh, and, and what's the difficult question here? The difficult question, uh, if the if the if the congregation of the small rural church where does it fit into the presbytery plan uh, because that and if it's well maintained uh, the small weekly worshipping number is one of the issues about how you then maintain not so much the building 
but the whole question of providing the ordinances of religion in that particular area. So it may not be about the building, but it's other things. The idea of trusted traders doing work for a cluster of congregations is good. How is this likely to work out in relation to the bribery and procurement policy of the Kirk, which has been adopted by all congregations? David. Right, yeah, I think I'll try and answer this one. Um, I think this is one of these issues which, if a trusted trader scenario is seen as something that needs to be investigated further, our good friends in the Church of Scotland Law Department uh, would be able to uh, have an input to this. Uh, clearly, yes, we would need to comply with uh, uh, the anti-bribery and anti-corruption uh, policy. Uh, the next question says, it is concerning that only anecdotal information is being considered where the abilities of congregations to look after and develop their buildings. Those presbyteries with up-to-date building surveys could provide analysis of the four kinds of congregations. Well, let's start at the back of that, but presbyteries having up-to-date building surveys, not all presbyteries have it. They, they kind of four categories, uh, four kinds of congregations have been developed following conversations with presbyteries over the years. And, and we, don't, uh, we, we don't claim that they are inaccurate, we just think the, the, these are the kind of basis upon which uh, there are various congregations. In some ways, we now wish we had asked, when you're filling this up, which category do you think your congregation's in? Because it's about that. It's, about, it's not just about the condition of the buildings. It's about the resources that are available to the congregation, not all of which is known to us. We, we, kn we understand some of the resources that are available to congregations, there are the, the tins under the treasurer's uh, mattress that we, we, we suspect are there as well. And certainly they may have the money, but they may not have the skills. And I don't think necessarily presbyteries have got all that information at their hand. It will be something that will be developed as, as we go on, you know, yes, but you know, it was the starter, starter for 10. Okay, the next one it says, you refer to bringing an expert specialist to assess and implement maintenance, etc. Can you also look at running workshops to skill up property fabric managers to make them more capable, discerning, i.e. roofing, damp issues, etc. We've been running uh, some workshops, uh, and I think, yes, we want to say a little more on this, and maybe I would like to come in, you to bring, to bring, you and in as well, because I think actually th this is an issue. It's not just about us. There's an issue about uh, building management by voluntary organisations in many cases. But David, you want to have a word first of all? Yes. The yes, I, I mean that's an interesting question because um, it's a recognition that um, congregations don't necessarily have the skills. Yeah. And the, it's really how that, it's identify <coughs> the level at which the information can be imparted. Mm -hmm. um, but a, I, I think it's critical that, that we partner with other organizations um, who in many cases have more um, practical uh, experience of not only running workshops, but actually uh, dealing with these types of, of detailed specialist areas. Um, I don't want to put historic environment Scotland on the spot, but uh, as an organisation, it uh, does a tremendous amount of technical work, yep. background work, um, on looking after historic fabric. And for example, uh, the whole issue of climate change, uh, there is already in, um, information coming through to Historic Environment Scotland on the uh, analysis and data gathering which they undertake, which suggests that it is actually a, a real issue. Uh, fabric, uh, meaning by fabric meaning stone, stone work and so forth, the structure of buildings uh, is having to cope with uh, wetter, damper um, um, weather in Scotland uh, and warmer. So, uh, which is a combination which these buildings have never had to face before. So, uh, we don't have the answers necessarily, 
but in partnership uh, with the likes of Historic Environment Scotland and with some of the other uh, folks represented by the Built Environment Forum, uh, I think this is an issue which we, can, we, we have to tackle, we have to make this information readily available. Yeah. I would agree. So within ecclesiastical heritage, there are former churches that are no longer used by any denomination and they might be in a, a development trust. They will face the same issues in maintaining the building as buildings that remain in church use and they also need support. But it taps into um, wider issues of anyone understanding how we look after buildings. Um, and I suppose separately, uh, some of the work that BEFS has done over the past 18 months, we've worked intensively with the Scottish Parliament and it's to address tenement maintenance, um, something that Raymond has spent his career um, involved in and still we are trying to look at how we uh, get buildings in Scotland well maintained and churches fall into that category. So all buildings need maintained. My underlying hope is that the issues around climate change, uh, which will force, is forcing everyone to look at how we use all our existing buildings and not necessarily building new because of embodied carbon, etc., will require quite a change in culture across all uh, owners of buildings. But it is a difficult issue to bring people who have no experience of building management up to speed to have enough experience and to know um, how to look after their building, which is where a kind of professional is then required to give good advice. Good. Next question is, have you ever thought of mobile churches in rural communities? It would not be difficult to fit out a bus or truck which could easily convert into a church space. A minister or other could travel to many places in a week. Interesting idea. The banks do it. Cinema has even done it. There's the, the moving mobile cinema. Have we ever thought of this? Has this ever been? Well, for an organisation which is, its funds are designed to deal with buildings related issues, um, I might be swallowing my tonsils about um, <laughs> funding a bus, uh, which uh, anything with four wheels and a steering wheel is notorious for uh, depreciation, um, but they um, it might not be a good investment. But I think the idea is not, not wrong. Uh, it's, it's, uh, perhaps that's more of a local um, response to a particular situation uh, in, in, a, in a, I guess, mainly rural area, um, but not a bad idea. In the 19th century, we, we ran around with uh, prefabricated churches and put them in places for a period of time and then they could be moved on somewhere else. So, maybe that, so that's the kind of point to put into the survey. Uh, so we're, we're getting ideas that we haven't had before uh, and I think it's useful. It, the next question says, how does the panel suggest carrying out the principle of reducing the number of churches as per the report and particularly in the context of rural communities. Which of you want to go first? I'll, have a, I'll have a go at this one uh, first. The, I, I'm always interested uh, when people use the word church or churches, and in this particular question here, I suspect that's the actual buildings we're yeah. talking about. But it seems to me that um, there is a tension difference between congregations and churches. And part of the, my suggestion, uh, as part of this mix, is trying to, what's the scope, what's the feasibility of developing a different attitude about what makes a church building? Does it have to be something that's made of traditional materials, uh, usually with a tower or a pointy bit attached at the front of it somewhere, uh, that's expensive to heat, maintain and uh, make accessible. So I think part of the answer is actually looking at the different ways in which we, um, we, we view a, a physical presence as a church. There's some interesting work being done through the Scottish Futures Trust, which is a Scottish Government uh, quango. It's charged with uh, delivering massive amounts of public infrastructure savings over uh, the next few years and it has been looking at um, settlements uh, of less than 5,000 people uh, which are out uh, at least five miles away from, from settlements I think of more than 10,000 people. Every single one of those settlements that they looked at, they looked at a dozen, 
all had a Church of Scotland building available. Um, now we're not talking about community purchase or community use, but we are talking about other uh, public bodies like the police uh, or the ambulance service or the post office or even um, a well-known uh, national bank, uh, re which has recently been closing its physical branches, but actually still wants a presence from time to time in rural communities. Now, either our buildings could provide that service or a congregation could say, we will move in to one of these redundant public infrastructure buildings as one of a number of users. Um, and uh, some of these are, 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 are the old police houses and police stations. So I reckon that um, praise in the pokey uh, would be a good um, uh, idea to develop in the future. It's not for me to say because I mean I'm, th that sort of decision making, uh, my understanding yeah. of, of of the of the structure is, it's presbytery that are kind of helping Absolutely. a group of congregations make those decisions, um, and that there's a process around having that discussion which um, may be difficult to have, but the process has to be gone through to decide where or where shouldn't be uh, closed. I mean, but tapping into what you said, there are also everyone shops online, getting things delivered to your house is not always possible, but if you have a local building that is open and accessible, then that also offers another form of income for, for a building that uh, provided a, a number of uses. Okay, the next question is, a lot of the knowledge in how to look after our buildings will be known by other churches, Church of Scotland and others, so could there be some online forum, community, email group, Facebook group, or whatever, so we can ask each other questions. I like this kind of thing because I like the idea of peer support uh, because that's what this is about. How do we support one another? Uh, and I think that would be a good proposal to put in to the, into the survey to say one way is to make sure that people work together uh, as well as the physical one which we've talked about in terms of presbyteries. But an online approach, I think, would be quite useful. Yep. Is that it? Surely not. There have been some comments. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just want to explain. Shall I just say that we've, we, we've been told there have been some comments aside in the online chat that have been helpful, and we will review them fully over the next few days. Uh, I think that would be... But we're still here. Uh, you, maybe we have exhausted you. We're, we're not yet exhausted, not completely <laughs> exhausted anyway. Uh, are, we, are we not? <laughs> no, you might be. Uh, if there's any further questions, any further comments, uh, hang up, we'll wait for a few minutes. Uh, are there any, Ewan, well, well, people may be thinking questions. Are, are there things that you think have come out of this exercise that didn't haven't come out of the uh, the, the, the other? Um, is it disrespectful to say no? It's a very similar theme of questions yeah. that have come across. Um, all the so one of the reasons we wanted to have the workshops was because we didn't know how people would respond and we didn't know how much cohesion there was of thought. And I would say in running the workshops, there is fairly consistent responses to the suggestions that general trustees um, are making with with distinct outliers and um, people who feel differently to um, the, some of the suggestions f feel it strongly. And I suppose two of the categories that are kind of that I'm aware of are people who view um, the church as the church building and the fabric as part of worship and as part of mission. But then there's also a lot that don't. And that, that's, qu that's quite a distinct gap which will be a challenge to uh, cross for yeah. The general trustees and for the general assembly yep. uh, to kind of make some suggestions on, yep. but we have another comment. Okay, another comment to question. We have a historic church in the centre of a small village that we are unable to open for visitors, and as a quiet space because our insurance, I understand, requires attendance to be present. Is there an alternative, David? Do you want yes, to? Yes, I, I should answer this one. I think the understand I would need to actually check this but I'm I think the questioner has has identified an issue that there needs to be at least one person 
uh, in and around a church building in order for uh, the um, insurance cover still to be active if it's opened up. Um, the congregation that I'm a member of, uh, our building is uh, open um, seven days a week. Uh, during the uh, from Monday to Saturday, it's open from 10 in the morning to 4 p.m. And um, often there is only one person, the church administrator, uh, who's in the building. The church administrator is clearly not able to be um, supervising everybody that comes in. Um, our experience is that uh, there's there's been very little disrespectful use of the building. And the very fact it's open, there's, in, there's clear invitations to come in, uh, to find a quiet space, to pray, to think. Um, and there are opportunities, amazing opportunities, to engage with folks who are wanting sometimes somebody to talk to, um, sometimes deeply spiritual, other times just offering a friend a friendly face and a friendly chat. Um, so yes, there needs to be a basic minimum um, what I would suggest is that uh, have, a, have a word with the insurance company. Um, haven't got their number uh, to hand, but have a word with the insurance company and uh, go over, discuss the situation with them and uh, see what they, what they say. David, just while on that, we have a, a forum that gets together with insurance people. Yeah. Is this something we might raise yes, with yes. them? I, I would quite like to see that we put that on the agenda yep. to be discussed. Because I know that quite a number of churches in England uh, are, are open, but they're not, there's nobody there. Yes, that's right. Uh, and so it may well be that we could find a way of handling that. Next question says, you say presbytery is responsible for the review of buildings in the right places, but will definitive direction be sought or given by the assembly to pursue this, especially where there are churches in very close proximity in small towns? An interesting one. Uh, I think, well, I, I can, maybe you should, and I'll add, add to it, but I've got, you're, you're the bureaucratic <laughs> flame, chair, look after the, that. The keeper of the bureaucratic <laughs> flame, as I'm always <laughs> accused of. Um, the issue here, I think, is that um, presbyteries already have the power and the discretion from the General Assembly to undertake this whole issue of parish adjustment, to give it its formal title, um, which is exactly looking at uh, looks at, a, at ministry deployment primarily, uh, but it also has to grapple with the question of what buildings does that deployment need. Um, so I, I think the existing assembly legislation actually deals with this topic. It's not something that would need to be uh, further um, confirmed or affirmed by the General Assembly. Uh, but having said that, there may, be, uh, there may be new legislation about all this as the situation develops, but at the moment, um, it, the Presbytery already has, uh, has the responsibility. I think particularly the issue here is it has the responsibility, but it has the, it's, it's grasping the nettle is a problem for Presbyteries. Mm -hmm. and, and to a certain extent, we understand that, uh, particularly a smaller Presbytery mm -hmm. where uh, if you're trying to grasp the nettle mm -hmm. in particular relation to one church, but, you know, so it's always somebody else's church you want to grasp the nettle for, not yours. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly, partly the issue here, mm -hmm. uh, that we need to find ways in which the presbytery yes. is, give, it, is enabled uh, and to do it. And part of the answer, the answer in, in, in our plan is that the presbyter we should have a more objective way of assessing what happens to, what, about the buildings which is why we've got what are the criteria uh, that we should what criteria should we have that determines what a church which churches are uh, meets the criteria of of well equipped spaces in the right places and also the presbytery needs to be able to under, to be able to explain more carefully uh, how it does it's very interesting, the Shetland story, where the, Shet where the Presbytery of Shetland has identified out of 33 buildings, I think it's 12 that will continue. Uh, now that's a, an exercise they went through. They've gone through with congregations uh, and it's been agreed. You know, so it's possible to do this. 
uh, but it's because there was a lot of extra, extra sort of work going into conversations, looking at things. We had uh, people do special surveys of the buildings. We talked about what the mission was in those buildings uh, and therefore said, what are the buildings that, that this presbytery regards as the important ones for, for the future and, and the invest in that? Okay, uh, it is interesting and perhaps concerning that much of tonight's discussion is about maintenance rather than really equipping buildings to be fit for the 21st century purpose. Comments is the question. Uh, which of us are good at, shall I? You start off. I, I, I've, you know, okay, I recognise that there are, as it were, three key issues. There's the question of how many buildings do we need? And that's, you know, that we haven't really, we've spent some time in that. There's a question about the buildings we do have, how do we look after them? And that includes both maintaining them and actually equipping them for to be fit for the 21st century. In some ways, what we are asking in the whole of this consultation is that we start with the question about is this building fit to for 21st century? What, what the purpose of it is to be uh, a place for mission, for worship, for discipleship growth. And therefore, you know, how does it fit that? So that really is the key question about how do we make these buildings fit for the 21st century? I do recognise that maintenance is, is part of this uh, uh, and that's why it comes in the third section effectively. So the first section is the analysis, the second section is about presbyteries and how do we, and the third section is about, is about the individual congregation maintenance. So yes, uh, I think there are, the, 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 there are uh, we, we have to spend more time on equipping the buildings. And if that means that the building is not suitable to be equipped, we need to move on to the next question which comes has just come in. Uh, unless, unless there's a, question, a comment that either of you want to say no, about that. No, no. Because the next question says, should we not be more entrepreneurial in how we dispose of redundant buildings? We usually just sell them that rather than trying to set up a local initiative cafe, recycling centre, cinema, etc. The answer is yes, we should be more entrepreneurial. And that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, there's an, an issue we, we have been looking at. Somebody asked earlier about the initiatives uh, that the, that the pr PS, the Presbytery Strategy and Innovation Committee, is trying to do. And uh, I think actually that the whole issue about innovation, about what we do about redundant buildings is going to be coming more and more the bi a big question, which is why we're suggesting that one of the ways of handling it of a congregation, congregations when the building, when, it, when, when there's been a union or a change or a building is to go, congregations have to look after it until such time as it is sold or disposed of. And what we are suggesting is that there might be occasions where that is, is actually not helping the future, either the development of the congregation, particularly the development of the congregation, or what we do with the building, and that there might be other ways of doing it, and the general trustees might then take on that, that, that role, look after the building until it is disposed of. And in disposing of the building, there's a whole series of discussions with people both within the congregation but out to be out, outside. Yeah. It's, it's also where I would say that um, Beth's, some of Beth's members mm -hmm. and um, wider stakeholders have a role to play. Your congregation may not be equipped, they're not, it's maybe not full of entrepreneurs who have experience in running a cinema, um, but there might be people in your local community who are interested in doing that and it's as um, a presbytery is making decisions, being aware of what the capacity in the community beyond people who are active in the church, what they would be interested in engaging with and the role that they could play. So I, that's one of the reasons why I'm quite interested in some of um, our members and other stakeholders 
the development trust associations, community um, support services, they will be coming to our workshop, um, Scottish Civic Trust. So there's a, there's a role for wider community to play in, in potentially helping the church become entrepreneurial or for the congregation to decide you as an independent body can take it on and we will rent it back from you as uh, has been used as an example at some of the previous workshops. Mm -hmm. I would, at the risk of sounding perhaps slightly downbeat. That was a bureaucrat. Um, <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No, it's, it's a purely practical thing. Um, over the years, we have, I mean, the church general trustees have been selling buildings for 80 years. Um, but in the last few years, the whole issue of community empowerment mm. has been very high up the political agenda. Um, and that's fine. Uh, the trustees have no difficulty in engaging with community groups, community organisations. Um, but the reality is that it can be remarkably difficult for local communities uh, to have the infrastructure by way of personnel and finance yeah. and other resources. Yeah. And it's all very well to say, what about recycling centres or cinemas? And I can see perhaps in... Uh, well-resourced areas, which might be uh, in, in towns perhaps rather than in remote rural areas, that there's, you're capa there are communities capable of delivering those sorts of entrepreneurial initiatives. Um, I think we have to be realistic. Uh, it is really quite difficult for um, communities to, to uh, once the, the enormity of the, the effort involved and the time involved in raising funding and doing all the grafting uh, and the expense of setting up as a proper, properly constituted body, um, there's all of these issues that actually um, uh, community ende endeavour initiatives are to be welcomed uh, and we support them and we're usually able to give some time to community groups to develop their ideas but there comes a point you have to say actually that you know this isn't really going to be working um, and you know we then have to face we're then faced with a more, much more prosaic issue of saying well here's a redundant building we simply just to put it in the open market and to see what happens um, so without being too downbeat I think we need to be realistic about the capacity of communities um, and if you bear in mind that a congregation probably has tried very hard to find and keep this building going find a use for it and if it's struggling then it's maybe no surprise that the wider community, of which it is a part, is also struggling. Okay, next question says, I wonder if you could give us an idea of attendances at your consultations, or has that been done already? I'm surprised that while more people are probably watching, the highest number of online contributors that I've seen would appear to be about 80. I think actually, just before I ask Ewan to talk about the number of people at the consultation events, uh, 80, uh, represents the chatterers, I'm told. That's the, the technical term, I'm sure. Those are the people more still are watching, but not engaged in the online chat. Uh, whole, for example, there are a number of Kirk Sessions that are watching this, and they are represented by one contributor. So actually, it's bound to be, well, we're, we're, we must have well over 100, actually, at least, watching this webinar, which is actually quite good for the first time. We've never done a webinar before, so this is a good experience for us. Probably and and it, prob it probably does show, David, you're quite <laughs> right. <laughs> but do you want to say anything about the numbers of, uh, at the seminars? Yeah, I think across the eight, there will have been about six or seven hundred um, in total. Yep. Next question, it says, is it possible to free up local congregations from all the OSCO responsibilities? This is an enormous responsibility for small congregations, especially if there are no members able or willing to take this on. E.g., can the National Kirk be one charity? David, this is one for you. Oh, right. um, I, th I, will, I will say we are, the General Trustees are not um, the body that's uh, able to answer this question. Uh, this is actually probably a question that should be being looked at by the Assembly Trustees. That was the new body that was set up at this year's General Assembly. And effectively, uh, this is sort of an issue. Um, Oscar, uh, the whole issue of, of charity regulation is actually, uh, at a national church level, is actually one for the Assembly Trustees to take on. It's a perfectly valid question, though, 
Um, we can certainly pass that on uh, to the Assembly Trustees and see if they will uh, respond to it in some shape or form. Okay, uh, our next question says, a question about standardisation. A recent five-year presbytery inspection showed work of around £8,000. The vacancy inspection had an initial total of over six figures, which I presume means over £100,000. Why are the differing criteria used? Hmm, this is exactly, absolutely why the questions about who does the five-year inspection so that it can be properly, uh, we can get standardisation. We have no idea about the amount, how much it would cost to bring the entire estate up to proper condition uh, because of the way the, ser the surveys have been done in the past. So if you want to support the standardisation, please do so because this is something we feel very strongly about. We, it will enable us to get a much better picture and if there's a standard which imposes right. Okay. Many, the next question is, many churches are listed buildings which imposes instructions on work that can be carried out and makes it more expensive. Does Historic Scotland contribute financially for essential maintenance? The answer here, I think, is Scot Historic Scotland doesn't do it for, es for maintenance. Uh, they will do it for a number of things. Uh, yes, uh, there are issues, and we are talking to Historic Environment Scotland, as they are now, uh, about uh, how, what can be done. We have had, however, one or two quite interesting little s stories which bother us. And that is churches have said, we're not allowed to do anything. We're told that Historic Scotland won't let us do it. And in fact, it's the local conservation officer of the local authority that is saying no, rather than Historic Environment Scotland. So if you are getting questions about restrictions that you think are totally unrealistic, make sure that you, cut, you collect the information through the presbytery and tell us, and we will pick this up with Historic Environment Scotland, because I think it is a, 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 an interesting question which needs to be dealt with. Just on the question of what Historic Scotland does contribute yeah. financially to is essentially uh, high-level external repairs. So you're talking about roofs and stonework and windows. Uh, in other words, um, a work which will um, make the uh, building, the envelope of the building, as far as possible, wind and water tight. Uh, it may be worth me commenting yep. on the slightest because I recently did some analysis, not, not involved at all with this project, looking, Historic Environment Scotland has 14.5 million pounds a year, which has remained static for over a decade as to how much money it gives away um, on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, of building types, churches benefit more than any other particular building type um, in, in my analysis of where the, all the grants have gone. So, and I know that uh, in talking to number of denominations, um, they feel there's not enough. But all building types would say there isn't enough money coming out um, at a national level that's been made available. But uh, church buildings have received quite a sub substantial amount over, I think I did, it was a five year period that I analysed it over. Okay, next question. There was a previous one. Was there? Yeah. The set, the, my question, yeah, oh, this one. Could we have a way to bring together examples that different churches have re-equipped their own buildings? We recently redid our AV, and it was word of mouth to know what others did. Can I say, yes, we should have a way to bring it to, to have case studies to, so that it's on the, web, on the website, for example. But David, do you want just to comment on this as well? It's one of these issues uh, where the, uh, the, the trustees' staff are painfully aware um, that we need this sort of resource uh, it's not an entirely uh, uh, negative story. Uh, for example, through the Committee on Church Art and Architecture, um, there uh, is an excellent set of resources which will give uh, quick guides to how you actually deal with things uh, to do with your building. Um, but uh, actual examples, stories, um, we, 
they are on our to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the chairman and I were uh, at the celebration of the opening of uh, the new church at St Rollox in Sight Hill in Glasgow uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and that is, we're already putting together a video about uh, how a new build uh, story has unfolded. Um, the intention is that these stories will be uh, realistic. They will not be fluff and puff. They will be uh, uh, the warts and all experience yeah, of congregations yeah. and uh, so hopefully we'll answer the question of what have the general trustees ever done for us. And can I just add that on the AV equipment, uh, we have just funded a new post yeah. within Carta. We have funded a post on AV. Yes, it's a, an, an audiovisual yeah. uh, consultant uh, yeah. uh, who has been appointed on a one-year trial basis to um, provide independent quality advice to congregations. Uh, and that will answer the question that's come up. Traditional buildings may have particular needs for special advice as a for example, on the sighting of AV equipment and screens, will Carter or similar continue? So yes, the, uh, uh, I think the results are already coming through is that the consultant has indeed um, uh, provided valuable advice to congregations um, already. Okay, the next question is, my question is on the questionnaire. The object of a survey monkey is progressing large amounts of information obtained quickly. What I don't know is how the comments in the boxes associated with each question are going to be processed. Definitely one for you, Ewan. They will be collated. Um, they won't all necessarily be published. Um, but the ones that are outstanding will be. The ones that are, the ones that are different from everyone else are more likely to be quoted. Um, otherwise, if there's a high degree of similarity, then an example of um, the free text quotes will be used uh, to say that there's an, a, a high number expressing similar um, responses. But the ones that have the new ideas that aren't already in the consultation document, certainly they would be presented. Um, but they won't all be presented um, in their entirety because it would then be a report that ran to an extreme length. Um, but certainly anything that's uh, interesting or, or an outlier will also be published. The next question is, when is the best time, e.g. local church review, for help to be given for a congregation to explore the future of its buildings and who is best placed to offer it, someone for presbytery or the general trustees. It, prob it should be presbytery in the first instance. I have a kind of view of, we've, uh, we've been discussing this, how we, 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 we articulate this, but it's a bit like uh, the, the presbytery is your local health center, it's, it's your first port of call. And if they think they need some help, they should call us in and we either we ourselves or we know of somebody else that can help at that point in time. But the real place is, uh, you've got it, local church review. That's what the ch local church review should be doing. Should be looking at the question of uh, what the mission of this church, what it's going to be like in five years time or even longer and uh, the buildings, the future of the buildings and the condition and what's the best way of making sure they are fit uh, and well equipped, so that they're well equipped spaces in the right places, uh, so it, it should be done as part of that and so the presbytery should do it. Okay, bureaucracy, a comment on the bureaucracy of the Church of Scotland, in that over the past few years, churches are bound to comply with instructions to carry out various surveys. Asbestos, fire and safety, structural surveys, electoral surveys, etc. It all adds up. Sorry, it does. And this actually is one of the issues that we have to recognise. We're running public spaces. And therefore, we have to comply with all the requirements of public spaces uh, that, that others have. So there are health and safety. There are questions about asbestos. There are questions about how, how and it's all basically around the health and safety issue. Food hygiene. Food hygiene, all the rest of it. Uh, and, we've, and, and the health and safety ones, I know people say, oh, here we go again. But actually, we've had some really close, uh, mo some real moments where I thought somebody was going to end up in court 
because of under the health and safety legislation. So it's really important uh, to deal with that. The, the comment I would add to that is that uh, the Church of Scotland has um, quite rightly uh, put a huge amount of effort and time and resource into safeguarding children and vulnerable adults. Um, it's all very well safeguarding the people, but you have to have safe buildings if they're going to be in them. And it applies not just to children, vulnerable adults, it applies to normal uh, congregational members, visitors, tradesmen, and, and we have a duty of care. So even if it wasn't uh, essentially um, the law of the land to deal with all these issues, uh, as a Christian organisation particularly, we should have a, a burden that people who are in and about our buildings are not exposed to harm in any shape or form. Absolutely. Next question. We are a Presbyterian church. Some of us need help in persuading our presbyteries to look at buildings proactively and constructively. Oh dear. Uh, what are the GTs doing to persuade presbyteries to come and ask for help and guidance? Well, I suppose actually that's part of the whole consultation process. If we get, uh, if we can go to the, the General Assembly with the results of this, and recommendations, then in fact that it's not about persuading presbyteries to come and ask for help and guidance, it's this General Assembly saying, hold on presbyteries, you've got responsibilities and the General Trustees are there to help you. Uh, and, but we are finding this as more and more, we are getting uh, a, a good response from presbyteries. Uh, I had one just the other day there saying, we need to, will you come down and help us? So we are getting and making real progress with presbyteries. Uh, but no, I understand that, that we appreciate that it's, it's, it's patchy across the country as it is with everything else. Okay, we've all of a sudden run out of questions. Are there any more questions? Because I think we're getting near to the point where I think we've done well, certainly for our web first <laughs> webinar, we have really found this very, very helpful. And the fact that at least 80 of you were uh, chatting, as it were, and uh, that there's probably well over 100 people, would, for, for our money, says this has been a worthwhile exercise. I would like you to tell us how good an exercise it's been by, for you, uh, whether it's been helpful. Uh, when, when you go to one of uh, Ewan's uh, workshops, he ends up by saying, there is one other thing I want you to do, he says, and you're way out the door, there is a diagram that says, starts at one end that says, not helpful, the other end says, very helpful, and you get a stick in your sticker, and you are to ask whether, where along this line you put it, and whether it will help you have uh, provided this, uh, whether, you, whether you're going to respond to, the, to it. So I think, uh, I really would like to say uh, that we would be very grateful for comments. Uh, Sarah Deeks uh, has been the member of staff who has been pulling all this together. And if you'd like to send your comments to Sarah, she would be very happy to pull them together and share them with you and, and ourselves. Uh, we've had one comment. You've had... M m no. <laughs> no. That's a synopsis of the comment. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yes, so that's the trouble. We're still learning this process, you see. We're getting messages sent to us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if there's, is there any more? Is this, can we say this is at quarter to nine? Uh, I think that's really done quite well. Uh, I hope that cut sessions that have been watching can now finish their business and we'll really particularly encourage you to fill up the form. As Ewan says, good strong cup of tea or a couple of glasses of wine. Uh, and if you're in the dram mode, then no more than two drams. But please, this is your opportunity to contribute to the debate, to influence what we get from Beth's, which will in turn help us to write the recommendations 
and the report to the General Assembly. It's your opportunity to make that contribution to the General Assembly. And so we would really love you to do that. See how many responses we can get. Kirk Sessions, please get your Kirk Session to respond. Presbyteries, please again. But individuals will be delighted to hear from you as well. So thank you very much indeed and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.